What challenges do food manufacturers face in sourcing ingredients? Can we order small pack sizes and quantities? How to be innovative and limit the R&D costs at the same time? Do we have competitive prices for ingredients? Are we covering demand, costs and resolving supply issues? Listen to our food ingredients experts discuss the biggest questions facing buying food ingredients today. Welcome to One to Taste Talks Food Ingredients. Welcome to the first episode of One to Taste Talks Food Ingredients. I am Jasper Schouten, CEO of One to Taste. And today I will talk with my guests about food ingredients and creating your own signature. My guests for today are Jos Vast of the Bakery Academy, Peter Naylor of Imag Organics, Egbert Sonneveld of Blonk Quality Ingredients, Henk Bell of Trigona Dairy Trade and Sharif Geara of Nexus Foods. Coming up with signature products is essential in the marketing of your bakery business. Right now, consumers are looking for food with substance. They want products that tell a story, that create an experience. For bakers, this gives a unique opportunity to innovate with food ingredients. It's a way to set your brand apart, create your own signature with a bread or a cake or, well, almost anything. Great, great to have you in the, in the podcast. Um, could you start with a, a brief introduction of yourself? Yeah, yeah. So I'm uh, Jos Vast. Uh, I'm from, from Bakery Academy. Uh, I started Bakery Academy in 2009 when I saw there was a, a huge amount of knowledge leaving the industry. And uh, I wanted to gain more insight on, on that experience and combine that with some scientific background. And uh, hence the name Bakery Academy. Uh, the academy part is for the connection with the science and the bakery part is basically with the connection with uh, with our hands in the dough. Um, so over the past years, I've gathered a few uh, other consultants uh, to work together with me to service clients in their challenges on product development, process improvement, and uh, some training and education. Okay, so in that position and in that uh, perspective, do you actually see um, that life cycle of new innovations is is getting shorter? Um, well, n not per se in the sense of that the total life cycle of an innovation from when it hits the market until it leaves the market is is shorter. Uh, more the, the the actual time we get to develop a product and bring it to the market is uh, is getting shorter. Okay, so you, you mean the go-to-market period? Yeah, yeah. So there is a, a actually much more pressure on uh, on industry to bring products quicker to market um, uh, with the risk, of course, that when the product is not that good, it will also leave quicker the market. So potentially the, the life cycle, uh, the lifespan of a new product could be shorter indeed. Okay. Hey, and, and what are typical challenges when, when people start to, uh, to innovate that you encounter in your daily work? Yeah. So it, 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 it depends. So if you have a more of a, a startup, uh, type of, uh, um, enterprise, you're looking more towards, um, upcycled ingredients, sustainability, um, potentially vegan or gluten free or keto friendly, more in, more in that type of direction. If it's more a sustainable uh, industry, uh, you're looking much more towards shelf life optimization. Um, so either it is longer or the same shelf life with lesser ingredients or uh, less E numbers in there. So more uh, cleaning up the label. Probably it's not completely cleaned up, but it's uh, slightly more friendly. Um, and we see a huge request at the moment in towards crackers. So there's much more going on in, in, in cracker, uh, potentially because it's uh, slightly more tasteful and having less calories than a normal biscuit or, or cookie would have. Okay. And, and, and those are actually more the overarching themes that you see or yeah, because in terms of innovation, uh, you're saying you're working with startups, uh, but you're also working with more re renumerated uh, mm -hmm. businesses. Um, 
if you if you could if you could balance that, how much of that is is startups? How much of that is 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 existing business? Well, I I, w I would say um, the uh, existing industry uh, amongst our, our our clients at this moment is somewhere around seventy eighty percent. Um, and of course, it depends on the type of project we have at hand. If it's more focused on on improvement, or it's more focused on uh, on development. Okay. Hey, and and can you give us an example of of one of your recent uh, exciting new innovations? Oh yeah. So the, I, I would say there are uh, a few um, that that might might be very interesting. So what we're actually working now with a startup. Uh, who is trying to uh, bring sustainable um, gluten-free products to the market as a some kind of bread roll, uh, flatbread type of product, which th should still have about uh, three to seven days shelf life out of the refrigerator, which is which is quite significant because the water activity in most gluten-free products are very high, and especially if you don't want to use any. Um, Preservatives or uh, or other additives to it. It's a, it can be a quite challenging product to still have then also a reasonable tasting product. So uh, that that that's one. And 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 another example could be that uh, we're actually working on uh, trying to replace ammonium bicarbonate in uh, in many bakery bakery products. On one hand, because it's um, focusing on reducing acrylamide formation in especially biscuits and and cookies, which Probably will be over the next year a quite heavy topic, uh, as well as uh, reducing nitrogen emissions, uh, which is especially in the Netherlands, but also outside the Netherlands, is uh, heavily debated uh, due to uh, the environment. Sounds pretty pretty exciting, exciting projects. And so, how does how does that uh, uh, that work in in when you develop a product like that um, and your search for ingredients? You must be on top of all the ingredients that are are available. Um, uh, and yeah, I wouldn't say all the ingredients, but uh, of course we we try to keep up as much as much as possible, and we try to find also the common ground. So we're look, also looking at what would be the technical opportunity for this product compared to another product, and how can we apply that if it's, for example, used now in the meat industry. Um, uh, how could we apply that in, in, in baking or if it's used in fillings for uh, a fruit filling, for example, how can we apply that into a, a cake or a, or, a, or a cream? So uh, it's looking at functionality across different processes and, and, and products. If there's one advice you could give uh, the people, what, what would that be? Uh, <laughs> Um, focus on functionality you're 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 aiming for, and uh, not adding just ingredients because people say you should add them. Um, just first define what functionality I need in my product, and then search for what could fulfill that uh, that need. And perhaps you can find some uh, unthought of uh, benefits. It sounds like you have a pretty nice and exciting job, uh, Jos. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. It, definitely. It, it sounds like you're operating on the on the on the borderline of innovation and and capabilities of ingredients and processes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if I if I can I can reflect on uh, what what we on the One to Taste platform see is uh, we see actually that there is increasing interest in um, getting samples and testing a lot. Uh, so we see that the basket size of testing uh, ingredients is increasing mm -hmm. over the time. Uh, we also see, and I think that is pretty similar as, as, as you saw in the overarching themes, is the health and um, uh, sustainable uh, products. Um, so clean label is something that comes back a lot of time in uh, requests from from our customers as well. So um, I think in 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 a sense it's it's great to to hear your opinion mm -hmm. uh, and to get your insights, um, and we look forward to working together uh, even more in the future. Great, great. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Peter. Uh, great to have you in the um, podcast today. Um, 
Shall we start with uh, an introduction? Uh, can you tell a bit about yourself and uh, about iMac uh, or Organics um, to to know more? Sure. So um, uh, thanks first and foremost, Jasper, for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking a bit about bakery. A little bit about myself. Uh, I've been in the ingredients industry for 30 plus years. I started out as a, uh, as a, a brewer, actually a production brewer then left that to join the, the ingredients world, selling into the food and beverage industry. I ended up um, for 15 years working at Wild Flavors. It was acquired by ADM in 2013, 2012. Um, I ran the UK business for them. I ran the Middle East business for them. And I ran the uh, India business for them over the course of those, those years. I was also a product manager for Sweetening Systems and branded myself as Sweet Pete. So I'm actually reasonably good at um, uh, sugar reduction in, in general. A little bit about iMag. I, uh, I went self-employed in 2015. And uh, iMag is one of my clients that I, uh, I, I represent them for the European uh, business. Uh, we have a team of three or four people. We uh, import through Antwerp and uh, we're ready to sell into the European market with our own direct sales, but also with one to taste. Sounds great. Sounds great. It's an interesting uh, uh, product. Um, so <laughs> how do you feel? Uh, so we're discussing also the uh, specifically the bakery industry, uh, but also uh, how people develop their winning protocol and what are important aspects <laughs> in that. Can you tell <laughs> us a bit your opinion uh, and then not talking about uh, your latest experience, but uh, we, we hope to tap into your entire history as well, if we may. Okay. So I think whenever you're putting a new product together, um, there are three key parameters. People may say more, but I think three. There's taste, texture, and appearance. Um, and appearance in that is, uh, is, is includes the packaging, but also what the product looks like. And the most important for repeat business is taste. It is the one thing that brings people back if it's a lifestyle purchase or a, a treat, um, it has to taste good as well, you know, and uh, the taste and texture are pretty similar. And we've got some products from Imag Organics that can help with both of those. Uh, the appearance is, uh, is, is what makes people buy something the first time. So the prototype um, needs to look good. Uh, the packaging needs to be right and the proposition needs to be right. But it's the taste and the texture that, uh, that brings them back. And the Imag agave inulin and the imag agave syrup could both be used well in the baking sector which we'll talk about shortly yeah so is, is that is that if you look at if you look at the um, the appearance yeah, i i think your your observations are spot on eh? i think <clears> if you if you crack those three uh, you have a you have a great chance of of having a successful product right um but if I look at the, uh, for example, the agave uh, syrups, you have them in five different uh, colors. Is that also why you, you, you decided to develop those? It's quite an interesting question, Jasper, because we do offer five colors. Um, typically, we sell two. Um, uh, and most of them, are, uh, are, most of the volume is actually the extra light because it gives additional flexibility in the end application especially in beverage you don't want to be adding color to the beverage and an agave syrup is typically used in uh, in in uh, as a retail product like an alternative to honey um for for at home use but but in a b2b environment um it, it's largely used in beverages where you don't want to bring a color or a taste impact the darker the color the more the taste it has a mayard sort of reaction that goes on where you've got the carbohydrate and the protein that naturally creates color. That's what we do when we cook um, onions. It goes down, dark brown and gives it that, that sort of flavor, caramel flavor. So the darker the color of the agave, the more the caramelly like notes. Um, so okay. it has some application in bakery and some uh, as such on the retail shelf when it's purchased as a squeezy bottle uh, for at home use, people quite like the dark one. Um, but the extra light is the one that gives most flexibility. Yeah, so uh, that's that's interesting because 
I was looking at more from a color perspective and you were looking more from a functionality perspective, right? Saying uh, in functionality, the lighter is more, has more end application uh, right. purpose uh, than the, the darker one. And also in taste, it, it impacts. But I think the darker one in bakery brings some some benefits. Um, but on the whole, uh, I think if I could split the volumes, it'd be ninety percent we sold would be extra light or light, and about ten percent would be of the darker variant. Okay, okay, and 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 an important an important point as well. Huh? Um, we saw in in earlier uh, conversations that that health uh, is is an important factor. So reduction of calories um, uh, um, that's that's an important factor. Now that's pretty difficult sometimes in the bakery industry because they uh, if you want to replace sugar, it's a it's a bulking agent. How how do you vision that? What what is your opinion on that? Thank you, Jasper. Yeah, uh, sugar reduction is key. We're all taking more calories than we actually uh, expend We're, with more sedentary lifestyles. So we need to look at our sugar intake and carbohydrate intake. The agave syrup is uh, is well suited to baking um, because it, uh, it, it's 1.3, some people say 1.4 times sweeter than um, uh, sucrose, your typical uh, beet sugar or cane sugar that is available. Um, that means you can add less to get the similar sweetness um, delivery. Uh, and with it being a, a, a very similar calories per gram compared to sugar, the agave syrup is a mechanism by which you can reduce calories in your final product. However, if you reduce the sugar by 30%, say, you need to bulk it out again with something. And that's where the agave inulin comes in. And the agave inulin brings uh, not just bulking, it brings a real functionality to a baked good. It has a, a, a fiber claim, if you're adding enough, to, 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 to have a claim of uh, additional fiber or in, includes fiber. It is a prebiotic fiber. This is a, a, a prebiotic characteristic fiber. It also brings taste, texture in some baked products, uh, uh, a spongier cake, uh, and in biscuits, a crisper, a crisper bite. So we are really quite interested in using a combination of the syrup and the Indian in, in bake, bakery uh, um, formulations. Um, we've done some application work ourselves in the kitchens over in Mexico, where we have some recipes we can um, sort of share with with, uh, with your customers that can really give them some guidance on how to implement the, the ingredients into their own end use market product. So it seems eh, that um, the, 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 the products of IMEC can uh, contribute actually to the three points that you were mentioning. Eh? So it can contribute to taste, can contribute to texture if you want to reduce the, the, the sugar content um, and uh, to appearance uh, by choosing the, the right color for the right reason. Um, it, it can help in, in, in appearance as well. It uh, can. There's one other thing that the inulin can do. It cannot replace all the fat, but it can be used to take some of the fat down if that is also of a, a significant uh, interest to the the. Uh, the brand owner. Um, I think it should be because consumers are looking at their total calories, not just sugar. And and I, I, I never figured that. But and if you talk about fat reduction, is that can you put a, a percentage on that, or is it in specific applications that you see that? I think we can we can get about twenty to thirty percent fat reduction using uh, inulin. I would not like to say whether that's sugar and fat at the same time or one is just fat so i think the way that anything is that we can recommend some recipes but always the the application people at the brand owner they would they would be the ones responsible for what's going on to the shelf so they'd have to do their own uh, kitchen work and trials and what have you hence the prototyping you talk about at the beginning and we uh, um, and we would encourage that to occur because that's their uh, their, their responsibility they 're the best people who know their product formulation, and we would always try and support them technically to 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 overcome any hurdles that they might find. I am sure that this conversation will spark some some uh, some interest in, uh, in 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 your products. Um, I, I, I'm I'm fascinated by it, um, and 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 seeing the the multiple uh, ways that that the product can can help uh, product developers, uh, but can also help improve uh, healthy healthy products. 
um, is, is just tremendous. Um, if I if I if I picture that back to what we see in 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 on the one to taste platform, hey, and when when we interact with our customers, um, we see that if you look at uh, launching new products specifically, uh, where we started off with, we see that they typically start uh, pitching to items in the market, um, and then like an A/B testing, see okay which one is 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 the most successful one. Um, obviously, that requires uh, the flexibility in volume, um, and I believe that you guys are very much capable in in. Um, yeah, supporting these uh, these companies in their uh, in their smaller quantity up to the larger larger volume, obviously. Um, yeah, so, and I think just to summarize quickly, iMag is available yeah. in Europe. We uh, we import through Antwerp. We uh, we have uh, smaller packs available for trial purposes. So yeah, or or even um, you know, best to come to one to taste and get the samples from there. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and, and we'll be, we'll be working on growing that. Um, Peter, thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, it's been a great pleasure talking with you and, uh, I'm sure we'll be, uh, in frequent contact. Jasper, thanks for the opportunity once again. And, uh, and, uh, uh, well, we'll be in touch. And if there are customers that you have that need some technical support, then we'll be there for them. Hi, Egbert. Great to have you in the, in the, in the talk show today. Um, I would like to ask you to just give us a, a brief introduction, who you are and uh, what your company does. My name is Egbert Sonneveld. I, uh, I live in Spain, but I'm Dutch. Uh, I'm here with my uh, wife, my Spanish wife, and uh, we have a company called Blonde Quality Ingredients, where one of the main products we produce is Teff. And uh, that's what I do already now for more than 10 years. Before that, I, uh, I used to work already 30 years in, uh, in the ingredients business, in uh, basically animal proteins. But uh, we started a new life here in Spain. And why did you decide to work with TEF? I, I was working with... Uh, with a with a dairy protein whey proteins and and we we started uh, producing dietary products for sports and, and and dietary nutrition and they were looking for a, a blend of proteins with a gluten free uh, product ingredient with very good characteristics so about fifteen years ago I came across TAF. And it looked like a very good ingredient because it's it's well known for, by the by the top sports people. Uh, it's it, uh, it's a, it's a very interesting grain for uh, endurance sports people. Yeah. So so actually, the the grain is gluten free. It's good for uh, nutritional value. Um, is it also good for nature? It's, it's very good for nature. That's something we discovered here in Spain, that uh, growing teff is, is good for, uh, for everybody, for the farmer. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting crop. Uh, it's good for the, the consumer, as we said. And it's good for nature because it has a very low uh, need of water and of, uh, of uh, chemical, the chemical products like fertilizers. So TEF is, 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 is really a good, good choice for everybody. So, so I assume that you are part of a lot of product introductions. Uh, people are interested to, to use your ingredients. Um, are there any complexities when uh, a company makes a decision to use your product into a, uh, a new launch? Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about the complexity around that uh, that aspect in particular? Well, first of all, we need the people to know about TEF because it's it's relatively unknown by the by the developers, especially in the bakery industry, uh, where we have no problem to explain TEF is to the original uh, users of TEF that are the Ethiopian and. Uh, Eritrean communities worldwide, they make a kind of pancake with it and then they have a kind of fermentation process that is very important for them. 
Uh, so with those customers, we have no problems in, in, in asking what their needs are and, and what, uh, what type of, uh, of product they want to develop because it's only one product that's called Injira. If we go to the Western world, uh, then we, we see that, that uh, step by step, people are, are trying to, to, to introduce TEF in a recipe. Uh, of, uh, obviously, because it's, it's an, uh, a gluten-free ingredient, most of our customers are interested in the gluten-free aspect of TEF. Uh, and then they discover the high nutritional values, etc. Uh, what also we we see more and more is that it's simply used as a mainstream ingredient in in in, in, in breads and etc. Because it's it's uh, it's always a very interesting in, uh, ingredient for its nutritional values. So, but is it readily available? Uh, no, it's not. A, it's 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 definitely not plenty available. There are only a few companies or farmers in the world producing it. So we have to, uh, for large volume customers, and for us, large volume customers is, is starting with, uh, with truckloads, uh, so 20, 24 tons. Um, and then we have to plan far ahead those quantities. So we, we have to make our plans with our, our farmers here in Spain a uh, year ahead. And that's the only way you can guarantee yourself uh, the volumes of TEF and with the quality that you need. Okay, so so if I would be a, a developer and I would love to to use your your uh, TEF ingredient, um, then I need to be sure to give uh, uh, to to have enough time uh, before I can launch it because it's not sure um, if I uh, want to launch it today uh, whether uh, you will be able to supply it. If it's if you're a large volume customer. That's okay. the case, yes. Obviously, if we're talking uh, pellet loads up to truck loads, then we always have enough TAF in stock to, to launch the product, to do a first okay. launch. But uh, once, once we see that the product is, is successful, then we really recommend uh, the, the, also the purchasing departments to come on board and say, look, uh, this is what we will need next year. And we, we try to make some kind of contract, long-term contract. Otherwise, the, 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 at this moment, for instance, there is not enough TEF. So there are too many people now running out of TEF. And, and they, they, they see, and you can see that, that, that it's not a commodity. You can't simply buy a, call someone and say, give me five or ten truckloads of TEF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you foresee actually that uh, the volume of this particular grain type will will grow in the in the coming years? I'm convinced. I'm convinced since uh, well, since we work with one to taste, we I've always said uh, with you guys, I, I want to double the volume we are we are doing now, and and yeah. and, and we can even do more than that. So uh, we have plenty of capacity, and the story of TEF is so good. So it can't be that uh, that uh, that the people will not discover it. So we are we are in a good position at the moment to okay. to uh, with this fantastic new ingredient. Yeah. And echoing also a little bit the conversation I had with Jos Vos from the Bakery Academy, he uh, was also working on on on, on different projects. And, and what you can see is that that indeed in the bakery industry, um, health. Um, but also gluten free are important aspects, and and in that sense, your ingredient is is, is fitting perfect in that in that uh, in that story, right? Do you see uh, specific periods of the year where more products are launched? Uh, do, is it is it some? Do you see some logic there, or is it just the whole year through? Um, you're you're working on projects. Well, in general, we all know that in the bakery business, uh, summer is very weak. And in general, there is the demand is low, and I, I, I've never seen products launched in uh, in summer. Uh, this is this time of the year is much more interesting to launch new project uh, products. So that's that's one. Uh, we also see some 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 very big uh, bakeries, industrial bakeries that are not necessarily interested in in gluten free bread. 
but they want to to include now TEF in uh, in uh, in one of their uh, multi serial uh, breads, and there I don't see uh, a seasonality. These are the usual blue chip food company uh, bakery companies that we know that were operate worldwide. But to be honest, they 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 always work with the one or two percent of the recipe is TAF. So it's 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 yeah. very, very low, but still then we are talking truck bumps. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Well Egbert, it's it's really interesting to to hear your 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 points of I have what you experience uh, in in your company. I'm very excited about uh, about TEF uh, as an ingredient and I think it, it, it does have a have a very bright future. Um, if I look what what we see in in one to taste on on specific go to market uh, uh, from the decision to go to market and to actually launching, um, it is 122 days on average. And if it takes longer, the chances uh, are lower uh, that it will will end up in uh, in in a new product launch. Um, I think your experience is longer. Uh, uh, oh, from, it's it's uh, much longer because because as I said. Since people don't know it, the, the normal pattern is that we send the samples and then they, they start playing with this. They do some quick and dirty testing on, on, on flavor and, and on, on, uh, on smell and functionality. And then you see people coming back and saying, hey, can we do, uh, can we do a puff pastry with it? Can we do a pasta with it? Can we do whatever? So, so uh, we, we still have to trigger the fantasy of the, of the developers. And, and with that, we do a great job with you guys. I mean, you have some very good people on board there that, uh, that help us with that. Uh, but, yeah. but the frustrating part here is that it's taking far longer than four months, as I said. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if I would wrap it up, um, it, it, it is important to, first of all, think about what your ingredients you want to use. And if it's an ingredient like TEF, you need to make sure that you start in time and that you give proper, uh, prognosis on, on what you intend to, to start using in order to secure, certainly if you take truckloads. Um, um, if it's smaller amounts, you can, Probably manage for a, for a launch, but then when things pick up, you need to you need to well in time inform uh, your supplier and in this case you uh, to to assure the, the quantity that you need. But but uh, Jasper, a last point maybe that is interesting to to mention uh, in the in the case of uh, product development is that very often. Developers need spe uh, specific uh, uh, characteristics of the product. So, be it microbiological, be it the fineness of the powder, being a certain color, being it whatever. And there, of course, we have this. The since we are a relatively small but very flexible company and very creative, we can do tailor-made ingredients for the for the for these customers and. The good thing is that if we agree on a certain number of tons of TEF, we keep those that, that grain in our stock the whole year long. And then whenever they, they need the product with their characteristics, then we are relatively quick in, in supplying those, uh, those volumes and with those characteristics. And we are very consistent with the quality and the, and the characteristics of that. Type. I think that's a very important point to mention especially talking to bakeries that, that don't like surprises in their, uh, in their recipes. It's their supply chain. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's a good addition, uh, Egbert. I think that's also important for, uh, for people to understand your flexibility in, in uh, working uh, the ingredients in different kind of specs. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I think I'm going to close it. Thank you very much, uh, Egbert, and uh, we'll be in touch and, and for sure we'll be doing more business together. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Hi, Henk. Great to, uh, to have you in, uh, in our podcast today um, and, and thanks for, for joining. Um, maybe the first question is, um, can you tell a little bit about yourself and about uh, Tri Trigona Dairy Trade so that we Get to know you. Yep. Hi, uh, Jasper. Thanks uh, for having us here because uh, 
is a nice uh, platform to present ourselves. I'm proud to be uh, invited. Uh, Trigone is an, um, an, um, from old days a uh, commodity trader in Holland, as there are many traders in uh, food products in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, maybe you know the VOC from the past. Uh, in the 1500s, 1600s, we were conquerors of, uh, of the East and the West, and um, I think we were the inventors of uh, the trading. Um, and Trigone is there an exceptional uh, example of. Um, founded in uh, 2009, uh, made out of two youngsters starting uh, in their um, late 30s, Trigona, coming from uh, other trading companies and thought, well, what we can do here, we can do better for ourselves. And that's why in 2009 uh, they started with, uh, with uh, nothing. And uh, today we are growth towards a turnover of around 100 million euro. And uh, we are trading around uh, 40, 50,000 tons of ingredients. We do that with uh, 15 people, uh, six traders like me, and uh, six, seven uh, in the back office um, who are controlling uh, the daily business. Uh, so that's a good combination. So the back office is um, very um, competitive and um, doing the job uh, very good. From the start, we were doing in commodities, but you see a trend in the last four or five years uh, that we convert um, into a plant-based uh, as well. So uh, we are and supplying some uh, dairy and also some plant-based alternatives to the, to the market. And then the applications is uh, feed, food, and uh, baby food. That's okay. in the short uh, trigona and uh, very flexible and also fast. Sometimes you, you will not recognize that in our uh, meeting today that because that was delayed, but normally in business <laughs> we, are, we are quite uh, fast. So we um, inform our customers uh, fast if it's possible or, or not. Myself, is uh, I'm a youngster of uh, 59, also um, born in, in dairy, let's say, and uh, also the, the last four or five years converted to, uh, to plant-based. And I think my, my business inside uh, Trigone is now partly, uh, let's say, 50% dairy and 50% uh, vegan. Okay. And and uh, the ultimate question is always, uh, can can uh, plant-based be as as competitive as uh, as uh, regular dairy? Normally, from the resources, I would say yes. But uh, due to the fact that vegan is mentioned as a speciality, um and uh, there's no benchmark uh, yet um okay. prices could could uh variate a little bit from from dairy sometimes it's uh, quite expensive um but uh, in in vegan there are also ex there are starting to be a commodity like like oat oat is really a commodity because yeah. um, everybody has oat milk and, and oat flakes and but uh, the special things like um chickpea or or whatever that could be still a little bit uh, challenging. And also in, in vegan, I have to say that um, it's more a processed food. And if you buy uh, sure. butter, use butter as a bakery, then you know, okay, that's, that's milk and the leftover of, of milk is cream. Uh, we put that in our, our recipes and then we know what we have. If they, pr if they produce a, ve a vegan variant and they want to have a, a vegan butter, what is uh, do doable at the moment, then you see in the ingredient list uh, maybe 15, 16 different um, parts in the ingredients. And um, right. that's that's complicated. And that's also making it a little bit more uh, in in price. Okay. Yeah. Hey, hey, I want to I want to tap a little bit into the into the bakery. Yeah? Obviously, uh, dairy is, uh, is is part of of a lot of bakery. Mm -hmm. um, and when when people want to to bring a, a new product in in the market, um, do you think that the 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 pricing is a is a key factor in success, or how do you see that, or how does yeah. Trigona look at that? Yeah, I, do, I don't see the bakery uh, sector as an innovator in in vegan and plant based. That's more a, a following follower. Uh, retail in Holland is the um, innovator in uh, in, in plant based. If you see the Dutch retailers, specialty with a 
with a blue and a yellow color. Uh, these guys are really uh, pushing in the market. And um, even in their private label, they do more advanced things than um, the brand owners in, in the world. So um, private label, vegan in the Dutch retail, that is uh, the trend. And then I think when the volume of these products are rising, then also the bakery and, and, the, and the restaurant market in, in Holland will follow. I think when you um, visit a particularly a Van der Valk hotel restaurant in Holland, the first page is uh, loaded with uh, vegan, but mainly vegan croquette. And you can uh, buy um, a, a croquette with um, a ragout, uh, but yeah. uh, you can also buy it with um, all types of vegan ingredients. Um, maybe also a, a vegan uh, portobello burger. Um, yeah, these these things come in mainstream, I think, in um, in the sector. Uh, but if you want to have special products, I think uh, the supermarket is the place to be. And uh, when they started up uh, three, four years and growing in, in, in vegan, they um, bought whatever they were capable to have their hands on. And nowadays you see that uh, some of these products are com becoming a commodity. And then uh, the battle for the cost price is starting. And then uh, several suppliers are kicked out or have to reduce their um, yeah their margin inside uh, the, the process because in the early days there was maybe one or two producers who could supply the Dutch retail with um, vegan products. But nowadays uh, in every country there are several uh, producers of uh, vegan and meat and fish replacers, dairy replacers. So now it's really... Uh, now the, the supermarkets are uh, again on the right side on the table. They, they can demand uh, a better price. How does Trigona position itself in, in terms, and then not, not only on the vegan side, but also on the mm. dairy side? Um, how, how do you guys yeah, no. position yourself? Yeah, you know, Trigona is, um, is a, a flat-based organization, so we're very uh, quick. That also uh, we work um, uh, back to back. That means that we buy from the market and we sell. Uh, these days it is not so wise, let's say, to have a big stock of butter because butter was uh, uh, two months ago, it was uh, 8,000 euro the kilo and it's now uh, 5,000 euro the kilo. So if you have big stocks, then um, that's not very wise uh, to do. That also implicates yeah. that uh, we can, uh, in a decline market, we can be a little bit cheaper than uh, the colleagues due to the fact that um, we calculate always uh, today. Uh, so yeah. if uh, one to taste is ordering uh, two or three pellets with butter, then we don't say that this was the price of November. No, but that means we will focus on the price of January. And that gives immediately in, in this market an advantage. Uh, three years ago, it was the other side, of course. Um, then the guys with the big stocks uh, had the advantage. But mainly this advantage uh, stays in the wallet of, uh, of the supplier. Uh, we are very flat. So uh, what we buy is what we sell. And of course, we, we have our margins in between. But yeah. Um, yeah, we also give every week uh, effective thoughts so that our customers can see what the uh, uh, development is in uh, raw prices, raw ingredients prices. That is open information that is on our website. And uh, the people at the bakeries can subscribe. And then every week they will see, hey, the butter is this, the butter is that, and the skim milk is that. That's all by commodities. In, in vegan, yeah. there's no, uh, no market... Uh, today um, yeah. you're really on top of the market of today right uh, yes. so that's our business model yeah yeah exactly so uh, um, is that uh, if you if you would if you would launch a new product um, uh, how would how would you suggest people deal with uh, for example in the bakery butter is quite important uh, yes. uh, they use quite a lot of butter um, what would you advise them um, in in that respect? If you are depending on on the market um, on this today, I would say fo follow the market. Uh, don't buy uh, too much. But if you really uh, want to have a position and you know that in the coming year you need 100 tons of of butter, then of course you have to arrange something in a matter of volume and price. 
And that is also yeah. doable. We are also, I always say that um, sometimes it's an, an advantage when you have not own a factory eh, because I'm, yeah. I'm a trader and um, I can buy from uh, 30 butter factories in Europe. When you have a butter factory, then you can only sell your own butter. Uh, so that um, there's always um, an advantage yeah. and a disadvantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Hey, Hank, that that makes me come a little bit to the to the conclusion. Eh? Um, if I look at uh, at pricing uh, with our customers, obviously it plays an important role, um, and I think also uh, the transparency that that we try to bring in pricing is something eh, both on the supplier side, as you know, uh, as on the customer side, we, we we try to to bring that as as open as possible, and I think that is also. Something that links back to to the purpose of one to taste, which is enabling the small and medium sized companies to be as effective and competitive as as the larger ones. Um, and it's great to have you guys uh, on the on the platform and and also supporting this uh, this vision. Um, and actually, it combines actually very well with also how you look at uh, at, at your business. So yep. thank you very much for yeah, for you're today. Welcome, uh, Jasper. Hi, Sharif. Um, it's great to see you. It's great that you, uh, you want to participate on this, uh, on this podcast of, uh, of One to Taste. Um, obviously, it's important for the listener uh, to know who you are um, and uh, to know a little bit more about your company. Would you be so kind to tell us about that? Yes, absolutely. Well, Jasper, first of all, thank you so much for for inviting uh, for inviting me to this podcast. I'm so excited. It's uh, it is my first podcast, so um, I'm cool. gonna give it my I'm gonna try to give it my best. So, um, uh, Nexus Foods we started back in 2004. Uh, the main focus of the company is really to provide a functional solution for the food industry and uh, one of the key elements is that we have a an entire scientific team that is working for our customers to listen to their needs and to make sure that we're able to provide them products that are all clean label um, a lot of the companies right now that we're seeing they're running away from all the chemicals all the uh, all the products that could be um, uh, deemed unnatural. So there are some ingredients that are natural, um, but they cannot use them because the public is not informed about it. So our main focus is, is here to work with clean label, allergen-free solutions, and even gluten-free solutions. So this is what we do quite a lot. And, um, and this is what makes us quite unique on the market right now as uh as uh, as we're moving forward uh so so super cool it it also fits in in earlier um conversations i had um you're really tipping all all the right uh points because uh, it's a lot in innovation about health it's a lot about clean label um it, uh, and nutritionist uh, food so i think you're 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 spot on with your uh, with your company um but Thank at you. the same time i i think that uh, it's not easy to run a company like yours, right? Because you have a lot of different ingredients. Um, and I think that the complexity in that sense is very high. How do you, and your company, how do you actually manage and, and what what are the major issues that you, that you see in supply chain? Well, there are several big, big issues in supply chain. So what we're looking at, we have... Uh, one of the things that we're seeing right now is availability of goods. The second thing that we're seeing uh, is inflexibility of suppliers around. And, um, and thirdly is timely, response time to, to everything that is going around. So what we're seeing, for example, customers as a starting point, what they want, they want a product right now. They want it, they want to see it uh, they, their production is running such in a such tight schedule. The, their warehouses are full. So they cannot even actually put, you know, you're shipping them loads and loads of material, but they want it because they, their, their production is running weekly or daily. So they need it on time. 
Now, what has Nexus been doing for that? Um, in the prior pandemic, uh, we've been always keeping stock. You know, two months to three months. It's a good rotation of material that is that is coming in. We're keeping it in stock, etc., uh, for our customers. But when the pandemic hit, we had to do something about it. We realized there were going to be much bigger challenges. One of the things that we did and we were very successful with is that we reached out first to our uh, clients, letting them know, listen, we know what's going on with overseas, especially the Chinese, uh, uh, um, China as a whole, uh, shutting down their ports, etc. We're It's going to put us in a very big problem right now. So we talked to them. We told them, listen, what we would suggest is bring in another uh, three, four months of extra uh, stock to keep it to keep it uh, in store for you, and like this will make sure that there's no there's no uh, problems in providing you materials. Most of our customers agreed with us, and actually some of them even helped us with cash flow. Because you know you're bringing in quite a lot of material, we needed to bring it in. Chinese suppliers need cash. So a lot of the times, you know what, we need to upfront everything. So what we did is that we got this in, we got the money, we brought in the material, we took a big risk in, in certain cases, but mostly it was already accounted for. So we were able to bring it in, warehouse it for our customers, and do the deliveries as they expected. Uh, one of the most proud things that I've um, I felt for Nexus and our team in the past two years, Jasper, we were able to deliver at 95.6% of all goods were on time. The times that we were not on time, it is because customers pushed us a little bit because they didn't want it. They 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 had some issues with it and they pushed us uh, further uh, a week or two. So we track our uh, we track our our progress, and this is for us is extremely important. So having that number so high where we see all our suppliers, uh, all our uh, competitors struggling with material, they don't have uh, the the you know making their customers wait for weeks and weeks. Honestly, I didn't see that that was ex- uh, acceptable. The one word I have to say that was forbidden at Nexus is is the word COVID. Never, <laughs> ever use the word COVID to a customer to tell them, I'm so sorry, we could not deliver this to you because of COVID. That was forbidden. Nobody in the company ever, ever used it. And we say, you know what? We just adapt. Wow. Make sure you get it. We know that sometimes instead of taking two months, it's taking four months. Well, be it. That's life. This is what we're living in. Let's make it happen. Bring it in four months in advance. Make sure we have the stock and we moved on. So, so how do you make your organization so flexible? Is it is it just a culture, or is it is it also uh, that you have a lot of expertise in this field? Right. Um, well, you heard it on Jasper. It is the culture. Uh, culture of the company. Um, uh, is extremely strong. Uh, everybody within the company uh, in the past, I have to say, we were um, we were able to transform Nexus in the past six years or so into a culture that is uh, believes in its core values. So we first of all, what we did is that we found our core values within the company, and uh, these core values that we live in are collaboration innovation, caring, and respect. These core, for, these core values are extremely important for us. And so everybody in the company must have these core values. Otherwise, they cannot be a part of Nexus Foods. So whenever it comes down to you know, making sure that the team is working together, they're collaborating together like 100%. Respecting each other's cultures, respecting each other's religions, etc. So everybody, they they live under one umbrella and in in harmony. Uh, third, being innovative. We mentioned something earlier that Nexus is about providing solutions, providing. Um, uh, we're always constantly solving problems for our customers internally and externally. So for that reason, it is. People are extremely important to be innovative in their way of thinking. Always think out, outside the box, no matter what. Whether you're the 
administrative assistant, whether you're in accounting, whether you are in sales, you're in logistics, figure it out. Let's make it happen. I'm, and uh, so, and the caring, it is caring for the customer, making sure that you, you respond to them in a timely manner, make sure that we, we're, uh, we're there for them. And most importantly, caring for the company. So all of that made, uh, helps us actually be so close to the customer, yet listening to them and, and following uh, their needs, actually. So I can imagine that if you have that if you have that kind of intimacy internally and externally, you can also head on uh, uh, address your problems and solve supply chain issues. Uh, so just just for a, a little reference, how many SKUs do you keep? Well, um, it is uh, we have about between forty five to fifty. Uh, SKUs that we we keep uh, constantly. Definitely, we we are um, we keep what we try to do. Uh, Jasper is that we try to focus on what works best for our customers and not to bring in you know three hundred or four hundred SKUs just to to please them. Our main focus is the service of our, for our customers, the quality of the material and making sure that it has a very good rotation. So the material is always fresh, is always is always new. So for us this is really very important. Yeah, I think that's a very smart approach, and and that might be might be also a key a key here, right? Is is develop based on the functionality that you need to deliver, and 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 try to do it with the tools that you that you that you have, right? Okay. Um, that way you you reduce risks of high stocks on products that you hardly ever ever use. Um, right. I'm I'm coming to an end of the conversation, uh, Sheriff, already. Um, I would, would I, I, I think that when I when I look at what we're experiences uh, experiencing as one to taste is, is is quite similar as you're describing, right? So we see that the um, online B two B buyer is starting to behave like a, a B2C buyer. Uh, we call that customerization of the B2B buyer because they also want their, their goods just like shipping tomorrow. And so, so short lead times is definitely something that, that can be a, um, a, a factor that is distinguishing you from others. Um, and I think it's very important also for your customers in terms of cash flow management and all those kind of things, right? No, um, absolutely. And, and we, we, we do also see that uh, when, when we supply, we supply partly from our own warehouse and we supply from, from third parties like yours, um, uh, that, that um, people are constantly aware of the complexity that is there uh, in, in, the, in supplying. And um, it's also about management of uh, customers in the terms of making them aware of the, of the lead times uh, in, 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 in time. Um, and an on time in full performance of ninety six percent, as you were saying, is uh, is pretty amazing. So, well done to you and the team. <laughs> yes, but thank you, thank you, Jasper. I, I hope to invite you to another podcast sometime. Um, but it was great to have you today. Perfect. Thank you so much. The pleasure is mine, and thank you again for the invite, Jasper. Availability is crucial for the product development of innovative products. And when scaling up a product launch, flexibility in order quantity is required. Launching a successful product demands fast response on supply. That means scaling up volumes and maintaining short lead times. This was One to Taste Talks Food Ingredients. If you want to know more, please check our website. <laughs>